Good afternoon to everyone. I'm Kostadinos Kudzopoulos. I'm the director of Greek House Davos. It's a very big honor to have you here today, all of you here today with us in our first session, our first panel, the first day. I will not take long of your time. Uh, we can start with um, our moderator who will introduce the panelists. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. It's the second time that the Greek House um, is in Davos. The first time was in May 2022. It was a different weather, a different atmosphere. Now we are finally in the f our first real um, World Economic Forum annual meeting. Um, and uh, yeah, I although it will sound m very as a cliche and as a Greek, I must say that although it may cold out be cold outside, inside it's very warm and uh, we are very happy that you're all here. Thank you. Thank you, Kostadina, and welcome, everybody. Um, it's great to, uh, to open the, uh, the Greek house with this panel on a, on a very topical subject. Um, we saw the, the WEF uh, Global Risk Report come out, and uh, even if you look at the top 10 risks, I think you can uh, extrapolate that there are a lot of them are linked to energy, uh, both the supply and also cost. Um, my name is Marcos Kamis. Um, I run Force Asset Management, a private equity firm out of Geneva um, with a bit or a, a lot of exposure in uh, critical metals and uh, natural resources. Very happy to be joined by our panel today. Thank you for, um, for making it here and thank you to the Greek House for the invitation. Um, Irina Gurbunova is uh, the head of M&A for ArcelorMittal and she's also the head of the and the head of the XCARB Innovation Fund, which uh, she's vice president at ArcelorMittal uh, and is leading uh, a lot of the new technology initiatives uh, within the group. And she will tell us more about, uh, about her group. Uh, Mark Dangle is the CEO of Dangle Asset Management and the founder of uh, FAMOS. Um, he's a very experienced advisor to family offices and high net worth individuals and has a lot of exposure also in energy projects in different locations in Asia and in Europe. Um, last but not least, um, Dr. Benedict Franke, um, who is the, the CEO of um, uh, the Munich Security Conference, the other conference, uh, <laughs> I, I will not call it the other Davos, but uh, certainly an event that gathers uh, world leaders um, around uh, key security aspects, and we're very keen to, to hear your views as well. Um, so uh, to start off, our topic today is uh, the energy crisis, the energy transition, and how we can neutralize threats that have appeared in the last year, some of them brewing for, for a long time, and what we can do um, to uh, so accelerate the energy, energy transition while dealing with this crisis. Um, Benedict, I would like to start with you. If you can give us a view of the, the status quo after these, these months of war in Europe, um, and how do you see the, the geopolitical framework today? Am I supposed to use this one? You, you can, yeah, sure. Do I need it? No, probably don't. So thank you so much for having me. Hello, live stream. <laughs> okay. First of all, thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to be in Greece. Um, and uh, the Davos add-on is, is okay as well. Uh, I'm not an energy expert, but obviously it has been an ever more important part of our work in, in the last couple of months, not only because we're a security conference, but also because we're based in Germany. And Germany has been particularly dependent on uh, Russian resources and has made an enormous effort over the last couple of months and whatever one thinks of the current government, the fact that we've reduced our dependence on Russian energy resources to zero uh, in 11 months is something that is pretty impressive. And I'll get back to the topic of government intervention later. But for us, this entire energy security conundrum is part of the bigger strategic competition that we see around the world. And for us, that strategic competition isn't so much between the democracies and autocracies of this world or the global north and the global south. It's really between those countries that believe in the international rules-based order and those regimes and individuals that want to reinterpret, erode or abolish them. And for us, that 
leads to a very different approach to alliance building. So if that assessment of the current geopolitical situation that you have two camps, even if you can't define them properly, um, and if it's right that the transatlantic alliance is sort of necessary but not sufficient to tackle all these topics, we need to reach out and broaden our alliances. We need to reach in particular the 38 countries that have abstained in the UN General Assembly vote on is it okay to uh, invade your neighbor and kill him or her. And uh, those 38 countries for us at the Munich Security Conference are sort of our target list. What do we have to do to incentivize them to vote differently next time? What are their legitimate concerns and worries and needs? And what can we do strategically to bind them closer to our world? And this is where energy security comes in. So at the moment, we have a lot of short-term um, tactics almost by governments, you know, solving a very um, urgent problem. We have a, a mid-term uh, view that, oh, there is still climate change and we need to adapt somehow and those two things may not be uh, be aligned yet and then we have the long-term view namely that somehow we need to realign our energy relationships in a way that strengthen democracies and not autocracies and for us that's the core of the energy debate that we sort of divide in these three layers short term mid-term and long term thank you very much and um our discussion will follow exactly this uh, short term, medium term, and as if I had known it. Yes, <laughs> and I would like uh, Irina to uh, to give us the view from her side. Irina um, runs uh, an important part of of the ArcelorMittal business uh, and has a, a view of of the whole business. You operate in I don't know how many countries in the world. I would like to hear your experience of of this year as a large major industrial player in the in, in, in the steel industry and how has maybe the experience been different in Europe versus other countries? Th thank you Marcus and uh, good afternoon everyone and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to Greek House for inviting me and uh, giving this opportunity to talk about the importance of steel industry in the energy transition and I'll talk more about it as we continue our discussion here, but um, maybe just to set the context, um, I think it's important to highlight the role of steel industry in the energy transition. Because I know perceptually, quite often people will not associate steel industry with the technologies and high tech and, you know, why would you need steel? It's, it has this image of a heavy industry, which is a huge polluter. And of course, first of all, steel is fundamental to the existing economy because you need, you need it for the infrastructure, for the buildings, but it's going to be even more critical for the energy transition. Why would you ask? Well, I think steel is required. You know, we're talking about renewable energy. Steel is required for solar panels, wind towers, for electrical vehicles, for electrolyzers, for um, low carbon buildings, for the infrastructure. So as such, it's absolutely crucial that steel is becoming, we will produce steel in a sustainable manner and it will play such, a, such an important role in the energy transition. But of course, what the issue is, is um, the footprint of the steel industry. Currently, steel industry alone accounts for around seven to eight percent of the global CO2 emissions. And as such, of course, this is a huge challenge, but of course we should see, at least I see it as a fantastic opportunity for us to make an impact in decarbonizing the operations and come into the technological pathways, how we can produce steel in a sustainable, low carbon and eventually zero carbon manner. So we as a group are trying to are leading the way and we pledge to become carbon neutral by 2050. And we also have a very robust map of how we're going to achieve it. So we are developing a number of technological pathways, how we're going to produce steel with the lowest carbon footprint. And the role that I play is we, are, we also launched XCOP Innovation Fund, that's a venture capital fund that we have in ArcelorMittal to support some of the game-changing technologies to accelerate our decarbonization journey. Thank you. Um, Mark, we spoke uh, earlier about uh, the perception and the reality and maybe how, how you view uh, what uh, we want to happen and what can happen. Maybe you can give us your opinion. Thank you, Marcus, and good, e good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having me in this panel. Yes, Marcus, we uh, quickly discussed on 
you know, these, uh, uh, you know, disaster we're in in the in the energy space, uh, especially here in in, in Europe. Um, on the one hand, we have hope, you know, with the geopolitical situation to find accords and get better. This is, you know, uh, the positive side. But on in general, I, th I just think our some of our goals in uh, on the environmental side, on on the CO2 emission side, are too um, ambitious, too utopic even. And um, I think there uh, we should advocate for a bit more modesty and also uh, become more realistic and less ideological because there are certain limits and we see it now and this is also maybe a positive side from from this war in the, in the Ukraine that makes us change uh, you know change our thinking what limits are on the on, on physics and also the power of physics and we can go into that uh, further if we want to have some uh, you know details or uh, you know, talk about efficiency factors, etc. But I think this is what we need to address, uh, and not just um, turn off uh, nuclear power plants uh, or have unilateral activity before we have something put in place to, you know, properly substitute the the current uh, energy safety that we used to have. Sorry, thank you. Uh, before we go back to Benedict, one question to Irina. Um, during this year of, of energy crisis, have you been able, um, based on your long-term plans, but also short-term decisions to change your energy mix in some of your plants in order to reduce some dependencies or um, use renewables that, uh, that were not available to you before? That's a very good question, and I think, um, I mentioned that we pledged to get to net zero by 2050, and it's supported by a very robust plan of how we're going to um, convert some of our operations from the coal-based uh, energy to green hydrogen. So we made a number of announcements in the past 12, 12 or so months in um, Europe, but also in Canada, where we recently broke ground on the first DRI plan based on green hydrogen. So there is a lot of progress that we are making, and you know, especially in the last in the last year. And also, in addition to that, what's great about steel? Steel is infinitely recyclable. So as such, we are we can recycle, and we should recycle everything that's possible to be recycled. So we made actually a number of acquisitions that I'm quite pleased to share. Over the past 12 months, we acquired four um, recycling businesses across Europe, which we have announced as well. So there is a lot of progress there. So to your question, um, in the last 12 months, I think despite of the very challenging geopolitical environment, we are quite determined. Of course, we need to, what Benedict was saying, I think the long-term vision is clear. Of course, we need in the, in the short-term tactics, we need to periodically divide, you know, change our approach. But as such, um, we are quite focused and determined and made a number of um, transactions in the recycling space, but also announcements around DRI and green hydrogen operations in Europe and Canada. Thank you. Benedict, um, you spoke about the new alliances. You spoke about the 38 countries you would like to bring closer to you. Um, could you give us a bit more color on uh, how these new alliances have been formed? Are they stable? Uh, are they opportunistic? Uh, and maybe a comment about some countries behaving a bit more nationalistically in terms of what they have uh, and, 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 and what they have secured already. Okay, so, you know, sort of, you know, let's, let's look at this in, in two ways. One, there's the national perspective and, and increasing awareness of the need to think about security in a comprehensive manner. That sounds like a buzzword. And everyone always says, you know, a comprehensive notion of security. But now I think we've really woken up to the need to look at economics, at business, at investment flows, and all these things through a security lens. So, you know, I, I've got sort of this national aspect on, on the one hand, and then this alliance aspect on the other. And I think that the, the two things that, that we need to find a way to reconcile is how do we make sure that nationally countries like Germany or internationally alliances like the European Union reduce external dependencies. We can do stuff like the circular economy and recycling. Um, Chancellor Scholz gave a famous speech a couple of months ago where he said, 
most of the stuff that we need in Europe, we've got in Europe, just not in the form that we need it in, uh, which I think is a very clever thing to say in a strategy that we should follow up on. But th the point being, um, this sort of national and sort of alliance view on energy security must be driven by an awareness of dependencies and vulnerabilities and risk. And this sounds sort of, you know, like a, a, an obvious truth. But in Germany, we did have zero idea at the day of the invasion how much gas we were getting from Russia and where it was going to and what we could actually switch off within our national grid uh, and at, uh, what the priorities should be. It, no one really thought about that. And so when people ask me, is Zeitenwende real? You know, this feeling in Germany that something is changing, then I would say it may not be real on the military front, but it's definitely real on the front that the German government and the German public has woken up to the need to map dependencies. And obviously our energy dependencies are A, the most obvious, B, the easiest to map, and C, the most difficult to solve. After energy, we get trade, and then it sort of trickles down. But if, there, if we find a way to do two things at once, name, or three things at once, namely A, reduce dependencies on the bad guys, B, um, increase uh, our alliance network through energy relationships, green hydrogen, get green hydrogen from countries like Namibia, bind them into our economy and, and network, and strengthen that link, great. And if we then do the right thing to, to stop slash reverse climate change, then we've got the triple whammy, as we'd like to say. I think that's, uh, um, one could say it's idealistic, but I think it's a necessity now, so we don't even have a choice. Uh, as, as you have said, you know, you've sort of played idealistic against realistic. I think we are now at a very interesting moment in time where they're almost the same. Because doing it has never been so important to do the right thing, because it will give us the edge. The interesting point is that um, I participated during in May. I participated in a panel which was called "Energy Transition Versus Energy Security," and I thought it's not the way to frame it. It's not you know one versus another. It's something that I truly believe has accelerated the long-term energy security. It shouldn't. It's just a dual imperative of energy security and energy resilience. Thank you, and uh, and I agree with you. Um, Two more topics that I'd like to address. One is the money, uh, which is always a... <laughs> 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 no, no, <laughs> no, it's a question to everybody. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, then, you know, I'd like to, to talk about the competition because even within Europe, but around the world, you know, China, Saudi Arabia, um, other countries are also vying for, for, for resources. We see this very clearly in the metal space. Um, and uh, it's, uh, you know, th there is a, a resource war uh, happening, and it's not only oil and gas. Um, and, uh, you know, these are the two topics I would like to get your views on. Mark, maybe we could start on the, on the funding side. Uh, interestingly, in the last few days, the WEF has announced uh, some numbers, uh, $4 trillion per year uh, to fund our, our new energy independence and net zero on top of uh, maybe another four trillion for renewables. Uh, the numbers are huge. Uh, where could this money come from? Well, uh, I think we're we're coming to the point now. I think all these, uh, what I call some uh, utopic goals on the energy side, they have a price, and they come at a price which I think uh, certain countries will will not be able to pay. It, it's a huge to a huge cost to the German industry to you know, for example, to get. Uh, uh, alternative energy for the industry, for the chemical industry, would be a huge challenge to, to replace it. Uh, um, Arcelor, Mittal, you know, is one of the most energy intensive uh, industry you're coming from. Uh, I think we need stable and, uh, you know, energy sources with a certain base load. And we can uh, definitely not uh, rely on uh, nocturnal uh, debt columns in wind and, and, and solar power, they need to be constantly uh, backed up so that the industry has enough power to you know, continuously uh, produce. But again, the cost is enormous 
and uh, I don't think it makes a lot of sense, you know, to you know, to criticize your idea of of the hydrogen importing from Africa, transforming one um, energy form into another and transport it. Uh, first of all, you know, lowers the energy uh, efficiency and it costs uh, uh, as well. Now. If we want to have change, we need investments. We have a lot of funds that are waiting for good products, um, good initiatives to to be, you know, wanting to go into to finance it. Uh, we have um, no doubt that we'll find, um, you know, finance further finance once our uh, waste to energy projects <laughs> come into the face of predictable cash flows that environmental funds will come and finance, that they love these kind of, uh, of things. Uh, having said that, in the beginning, we need you know, initiative and, and money from friends and family starting and other enthusiastic people uh, that bridge this initial um, phase before all these activities become bankable. Thank you, Mark. And I have a question for you, but if you have a yeah, comment, no, please I go ahead. I think it's, uh, I, I mentioned, I know that the situation is very challenging and, you know, we can be super gloomy, but I'm a, a very optimistic person by nature. So, of course, I think we all appreciate the challenging environment we are in and all the issues that we are facing. But I must say I've seen two positive trends in the past 12, 12 months or so. Uh, one is I remember that um, during COP27 in Glasgow, my key takeaway was that it was about realization and awareness and commitments. And I've seen so many companies, you know, pledging net zero, announcing all sorts of manifestos and commitments and collaborations. So that was my key takeaway. 12 months on in Egypt during COP28, what was great to see was no longer about commitments and pledges. It was about you know, from commitments to action. It was much more around demonstration projects, pilot projects, how are we going to, to get to, you know, to scale things up. So that's great because, you know, you need to, of course, you need all this funding, but what are you going to fund? So that's a great thing to see that there is a lot of progress. On the funding side, where the money is going to come from, I've seen so, mu so much activity in the clean tech space, again, in the last 12 months or so. So many funds have been formed. Again, we established ourselves as one of the, the most important industrial venture player. We invest in, in technologies. We are supporting some of the emerging technologies. And I know that the funding that's required, I mean, you, you're talking about trillions. I was reading yesterday, a couple of days ago, a report published by International Energy Agency that was quoting something like 650 million, uh, sorry, billion is required per year on renewable energy projects by 2030. But I think regardless, it's, it's huge amounts of investment which are required. And their point was that um, based on the current commitments, it will only cover like two thirds or just above the half of the requirements. So there is still a gap. The good thing, again, on the optimistic note, is that you know you have more funds being announced, more capital is being committed, but it needs to go hand in hand, because you know you can you can raise lots of funds, but what are you going to fund? So you need to really we need to ensure that we also collaborate with the startups, with the uh, you know with the industries like ours to scale things up, and with the you know fund providers, uh, providers and the governments because it's really you know across the value chain you can't no one can do it alone. We must move faster, but in order to, to move faster, we need to really establish the story. If I'm if I'm no, no. kind of covering a lot of subjects, I know we start no we're problem, so we start talking about money, and I just uh, but let uh, me pick up on this uh, and uh, raise a question to uh, to Benedict. I think. Um, uh, mining is interesting uh, because, uh, as you said, Mark, you know, we need to solve some problems locally. We cannot always we cannot always solve them with uh, with international partners or uh, you know uh, remote partners. But there is an issue that uh, you know the, the the NIMBY factor that we don't want them in our backyard, not in my backyard. Um, and we know, you know, without metals, there is no energy transition, but we want the mind as far as possible from our home. Um, how is the policy making dealing with this? And we saw in Germany there were protests against coal mines. Um, and the truth is we are talking about an energy transition. Unfortunately, it cannot happen from one day to the other. 
how do you think the policy making will will deal with the transition elements in terms of uh, location of resources, uh, mining that is needed, for example, um, and of course then allocating funds to it. Okay. I'll say a little about the, the funding issue because it's obviously the heart of the matter in a second. But let me tell you a little anecdote. So about three months ago, um, the CEO of the world's second biggest mining company called and and sort of said, you know, I, I have one big worry and can I explain it to you? And I said, okay, yeah, please go. And he said, you know, we need all these metals to power your green transformation in Germany and in Europe. Um, you don't want us to mine them in Europe. You don't want us to mine them in autocracies. You don't want us to mine them in global commons. We don't have any planet nearby that we can mine it from. How the hell are we supposed to do this? And you know, that I, I thought that was a pretty simple question, but rather well put. Because if you put all the hurdles that we've put in their way together, you know, they may make sense individually, but cumulatively, they make zero sense because we make it absolutely impossible for them so the one place where they would still be uh, able to do mining was China, which now for different reasons is on our, ooh, maybe that's not a good idea list. And, and, and hence, that, that is a hugely important issue. And you know, uh, all the things that I've said so far, uh, a lot of them are obviously overly simplified. Um, and a lot of them are incredibly complicated. But some of the basic truths and problems are very simple. If we want to have an energy transformation, we need resources. We will only get them from the places where they are. And we can't, you know, change that fact. At the same time, at the same time, I think everyone has woken up to the need to avoid replacing one dependency with another. And, and, and so that is just out there and we need to balance. Um, when we, when we talk about funds, let me do a little promotion for the Munich Security Conference website. So over the last year, we did a project that we called the Transatlantic To-Do List. We wanted to check with the transatlantic partners what they would have to do to advance the narrative that I've presented. You know, reach out to other allies, strengthen transatlantic cooperation as a core of, of a broader multilateral reinvigoration, and stop revisionist powers. And so we came up with 127 very, very, very concrete action items. And you find them on our website, and you always look smart if you quote them, because they've really been put uh, on that list by the smartest people around. And of those 127 um, sort of action items, 35 are on energy security, and of those, 31 are on financing energy security. So how do you make stuff commercially viable? How do you break down investment borders? How do you use the power of the state rather than rely on a market that isn't ready yet? And I think what we've seen, at least in Germany, is, is the Wumms theory. Um, Wumms is the German word for WOMI. So the first Wumms was the 100 billion for the military. We then, two weeks later, came up with 200 billion for the, the social services and you know heating costs. Uh, and, and stuff like that. And now today we've came up with 300 billion, again for the military. So to be perfectly honest, I think that money doesn't seem to be an issue currently. And it will, it will come back to bite us. Um, but for the moment, we're in a very, very interesting period where we might be able to push through government subsidies and support of previously unheard volumes. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think what this also comes, um, you know, to to the end is that when we're in a in a situation like this, with a crisis, we get inventive, you know, uh, geopolitically. And the second thing is it's the price signals, you know. All of a sudden, when prices hike, uh, uh, alternative energies and other stuff become interesting. And I think we should learn also to to see these signals instead of ignoring them on the one hand or even trying to um, you know, push them aside or, or ignore them or try to put a, a, you know, a cap on the prices and things like that. Uh, take rare earths. We thought this uh, you know, was, was a lost case to, to the Chinese. Now, surprise, surprise, a deposit has been found in, in Sweden, you know? This is a matter of, of the price because it's, it's, inter it's interesting to look and to find other uh, alternatives. So I think we, 
you know, I couldn't agree more what you're saying, but I think we should also be led by the markets and don't ignore them. Thank you, I agree. And um, <coughs> not on the 100, sort of 200, 300 billion range, but uh, even on a smaller scale, we've seen Germany allocating, uh, one example was 800 million or 300 million in government guarantees to commodity traders that has a multiplier effect in their ability to source materials um, that will come into Germany or into Europe more generally. There are a lot of tools, uh, financing tools, that can have a multiplier effect. Um, I know, you know from your experience in Europe, um, have you been interacting with governments in terms of dealing with the energy crisis or new projects, or is it more private financing? There is certain interaction. I think, again, it's it's so important to be joining hands together, and I think the governments and uh, industry should work together on this. You know, I'm not I'm not going to comment on things specifically, but this is definitely mm -hmm. the case. I think one one thing you could you could add to the you know the, the government side, and you know I think which would enhance things also is to reduce the rigidity of you know the regulatory framework i think governments are tending to be way too much into the details of uh, what we're trying to achieve on on an uh, environmental side that you know sometimes it becomes a even a self-destructive um, issue um, for example if you take um, a, 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 you know conventionally powered car fossil fuel car with you know gasoline and you add um, synthetic fuel to it which is you know s co2 neutral this car in the eyes of of our governments here is still considered a co2 producing uh, polluting car on the other hand if you take uh, an electric car a tesla per se is a clean car which you know we know is also not the truth, but because these um, uh, rules and and, uh, and 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 laws have been put like this, they make things completely um, y you know ridiculous in terms of what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, maybe I can also add a couple of points uh, on this. I think, of course, it's important what you're saying to look at things holistically. And then if you look at our whole value chain, we need to start with renewable energy and produce hydrogen, but we also need long duration energy storage. So with XCARP Innovation Fund, that's how we are approaching things. We're trying to support some of the disruptive technologies because it's not just one silver bullet that's gonna solve it all, it's really, um, like pieces of the puzzle put together that need to really bring us to this perfect uh, net zero picture. And that's what we are trying to do. And of course, you know, once you identify those technologies, they are, you know, at the lab might be fantastic, but of course it's also really important to make sure that we scale them. And this is where we come in because we can, you know, we're experienced in scaling things up and we have the industrial platform to try and test those technologies to establish the industrial, um, viability and, and scalability as well. But the point I was trying to make is that, for instance, in the US, because you were asking about the governments, the latest Inflation Reduction Act supports exactly those green, te uh, green technologies. Of course, you can criticize to the extent, you know, it's not overly protectionist, or does it support, does it provide really the best, you know, level playing field, but at the same time, I understand that there is a lot of um, incentive and um, intention to accelerate this transition, to incentivize some of those disruptive technologies, to, to, to remove some of those barriers and provide them with incentives to accelerate and, and create this uh, renewable energy and clean energy infrastructure the soonest. Thank you. And, uh, you know, to take from the technology side uh, and maybe look outside Europe as well, um, I have experience, we're invested uh, in Africa, um, how do you see these e emerging economies uh, sort of transitioning? Because sometimes uh, with technology you can jump from uh, one uh, stage to another faster. We saw that with mobile phones. Uh, do you think the energy transition might have some accelerating effects in emerging economies that could go straight into renewables um, uh, through new technology or through existing technology deployment? <laughs> and anyone can take the question. <laughs> 
you know that that's I've I, I forgot to answer the point. No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a really interesting. I, I want to go back to the role of the state later on because I think that's at the heart of the matter, uh, and I also want to get back to does it make sense to produce green hydrogen in Namibia if it isn't commercially viable? And I've now got the opportunity to link the two because I think sort of you framed your question in a way, does it make sense for countries to leapfrog development stages? I think it makes a hell of a lot of sense to look at energy as an export product and, and find another way to, to finance development domestically. And Namibia is a great example. Given you know the wind at their coast, they are just predestined to produce green hydrogen. And yes, to build the infrastructure, incredibly expensive and complicated. And it may not be, you know, worth doing it commercially for many, many years. If Germany puts two and two and two together, A, the need to, um, uh, for historic reasons, be very supportive of Namibia's development. It used to be one of our colonies. Uh, we didn't really... Uh, leave on a happy note and I think there is much that we need to do and I think we would very much prefer to finance a, a, a green energy transition in Namibia rather than just pay uh, I think that the required 100 billions or whatever the, the Herero um, have, have asked. So you know there is an historic aspect for us to do this. Second we believe that giving Namibia yet another thing to export in addition to zebra skins or whatever their main export is um, is a very clever strategy to motivate other countries to follow in their path. So again, none of those two has an economic or a business aspect to it. It's a strategic decision. And you know, Germany doesn't come across as the most strategic country ever currently. But there is there is a thought within the security community in Germany and with the Chancellery, and I don't want to put any words into the Chancellor's mouth, he'll be here on Thursday, and he will talk about exactly that. Why does it make sense for Germany to ignore the markets here and there? Uh, and, and why do we do things that at first may seem to undermine European unity? You spoke about the need to do things together because we believe we actually, luckily, do have some money left that we can invest in stuff like that because it will make our alliances more sustainable and it will provide an alternative to gas from Azerbaijan and Qatar down the road, which, let's face it, you know, they are sort of good short-term options. They're pretty abysmal medium to long-term options. And we just need to put our eggs in more basket and not destroy global governance in the process. And that's why it makes sense, in my eyes, to invest heavily in Namibia, even though there isn't yet a business case. Thank you. And I think if, if, if you don't do it, uh, or the European Union doesn't do it, another country will do it. Uh, China, uh, China or, 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 or someone else. You know, th there is such a, a rush for these resources. Um, last week, uh, there was the Future uh, Minerals Forum in Saudi Arabia, uh, which became, in one year, the largest mining uh, uh, conference ever. Um, and they announced a, a 10 billion fund to, to acquire assets outside Saudi Arabia. Uh, I know the U.S. and the U.S. Defense Department, the U.S., uh, uh, State Department is looking for such assets, so there there is this competition, um, and you know we have to uh, you know to secure these resources, but I think also do it in a responsible way. I couldn't agree more what you're saying. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I didn't say that one should not invest in in these countries, mm -hmm. just that they uh, be able to do it, but it, it depends whether it's worthwhile for them to export it and make money on it. But I think. Uh, the question of leapfrogging, um, you know, some stages that we went through in, in the developed markets, whether the emerging markets can jump, I think yes. Yes, I mean, look at uh, Nigeria, look at India, look at these um, uh, countries that produce an enormous amount of waste and still piling and with, you know, technology like uh, the one we we can advocate, you solve two problems, you know. You rehabilitate waste sites on the one, on the one hand. Um, you produce energy um, by uh, turning methane gas into electric power, feed it in the grid, and, um, and uh, you know, you clean the environment. So, yes, I think it's, it's, there's a lot of potential, and I think it's something we need to do. And, and need to help and, and transfer that uh, technology and, and the management capacity to, to execute it. 
Thank you. Um, I think we're slowly coming to, uh, to to the close of our of the panel. I wanted to get your concluding comments. Uh, maybe we can start with Irina uh, about you know how do you see the future? Um, you know, this year was indicative of what a crisis can do to the energy system, um, and there are a lot more potential crises that can come. Do we see a future where one crisis will sort of come after the other and, you know, we'll be going one step forward, one step back in the energy transition and in, at the end of the day, the security here in Europe and globally from an energy perspective or maybe more optimistic uh, view? And the well, question is to the three of you. Well, you know, I'll start. Uh, I mean, it's a good question, first of all. Thanks, thanks, Marcus. And I think... This energy crisis, I would view as an opportunity to really redesign our approach, and that applies to the companies and to the industries and to the government, to redesign our approach and, and change the business models so that we can produce things sustainably and that you know we use the energy which is sustainable for the planet. So I view it as an excellent opportunity. Of course, it will come with challenges. It comes with a lot of hurdles and, and issues, and we can endlessly talk about all sorts of ways of how we can address it and what needs to be specifically done in order to accelerate. But my key points and my key comments would be this is, you know, this is a, a responsibility and an opportunity for us to change the business model to ensure that we do things sustainably going forward. And then, you know, some of those crises in the future will not result in, in, in huge shocks that we experienced last year. I don't know if it's still... Can you hear me, guys? We've run out of time, probably. <laughs> <laughs> run out of power. Extra light goes <laughs> on. <laughs> no power anymore. There is no power. <laughs> no no energy. You can turn it on and off. Now it works again. Shall I? Um, maybe uh, a few comments or, 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 or thoughts um, as an ending note, which are not from me, but I kind of re try to repeat the wish list of Professor Hans Werner Sinn. I'm, I'm sure you know a him. Good Munich uh, fellow. He had this fantastic speech, uh, Christmas speech, um, and um, I would like to repeat. <laughs> <laughs> um, the wish list that he had he um, proposed, and it goes like this: first, stop the bans, re-entry of nuclear power, fracking, natural gas pipelines, and new gas storages, end unilater uh, unilateralism, and build an active climate club where China and India are integrated. Because only then we can, you know, talk about worldwide um, emission trading, and also make changes in 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 the behavior of the production of energy. Um, with COVID, for the first time ever, the um, oil producing countries lowered their production because it was a worldwide shock. Before that, for the last 50 years, this never happened. So we need an, you know, an initiative on, on a global basis, and then I think we will have more um, realistic uh, chances for results. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I, I prefer to-do lists over wish lists. Um, I, I think the one key to-do that, that we as sort of, whatever you call it, the West, the, the, the liberal democratic order, uh, the rules-based international order. The one to do that we have is to to accept the fight where the liberals take it. So we can no longer separate security policy from energy policy, competition law, um, uh, regulatory approaches. We need to make the most out of the assets and the possibilities and the reach and the networks uh, and, and the money that we have. And I think one of the key battlefields, if you so want, really is the the reduction in energy dependency. The, the progress that we will be making in the next decade will shape not only our success when it comes to climate change, but also our um, position in a fight that we believe is definitely going to come. Whether it's going to be with China militarily, which I don't think, uh, or with Russia once again militarily, or with all these countries politically um, is, is yet to be decided, but that it doesn't look like we're all suddenly going to agree in the next couple of years on the vision 
of a world that we want, I think is pretty clear. And so energy is just a key, key, key issue of it all in addition to powering our society. So follow the Munich Security Conference. Once you're done here, uh, it'll be up on our agenda. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, you know there is an optimistic uh, tone, even though there are challenges. Um, and uh, you know, energy crisis and energy transition do go together. I, th I agree with Irina. Um, we need to find the money. We need to find the the willingness of politicians and businessmen to take these leaps. Um, and I think leaders like you and others here in Davos uh, are taking these steps. Thank you again, Benedict, Mark, Irina. Thank you for your time. And uh, good luck to the rest of the Greek House event. Thank you. Please. I'm the devil's advocate. I'm a lawyer. Okay. Now. Who let him in? <laughs> <laughs> I snicked from the other door behind. <laughs> now, uh, very, very clever. We're talking about the next generation's uh, energy sources. However, we know it is a given that the oil producer countries are very few, which means, being that in five, six, five, six countries, they can control the product of their soil. How about you make all these projects, ammonia, hydrogen, whatever, and we're producing, in order to produce them, you, hand, you spend 100, whatever it is, and they come after a few years, the oil producer can say, well, we sold, sell the, the barrel, 10 years, $10 a barrel, what do you do? You're costing, you're spending 1,000, and now we have the, the, we have the, the obligation, not the, the, the picture of energy in selling the same product, the same en energy-wise, for 10 euros, because they can, they can become a second OPEC. And they agree to $10, 20 30 whatever, but multiple times less than. So we have what, remember the article, the, the, the foreign affairs of class of, of class yeah. of, class of, of, of culture. Now we have the class of financiers. The financiers of the new product, the financiers of the whatever have to write off of their investment. So, that sounds like a question. Well, I mean, this is what... It's, a, it's, a, it's scenarios, not... No, no, but I think theory. it's what, what else is happening now. I mean, India and, and China, they're buying the cheap Russian oil. It's, we already have it. It's there. Grand size uh, population of this country, so they can do that in a short time, in a short period of time. They do it. They neglect the situation of the, of the country. They do whatever they want because they are a lot of people. They can control these people by their, their, their size. Now we have a, a, a procedure for years and years to make a new product, very clever, very nice. This is a good one. And we have the, the defense. The defensive strategy of the oil producing countries 10 years from now, spending $10 uh, the, the barrel. So what do you do? I think the risk is... Another crisis, please. I think it shouldn't be only about economics, right? Because, you know, we have a number of countries and companies committing to the, you know, to net zero and to the reduction of CO2. So it's not just about... Uh, economics. I think now I see more and more commitment, what I was talking about, and pledges. And I've seen some banks, like I think HSBC recently announced they're not going to fund any more oil and gas development. So you, you can see a lot of those trends. So it's, you know, it's all of a sudden, if it becomes opportunistic for some, someone to invest, I do hope there are going to be enough measurements to discourage this so that, you know, everyone is pretty much serious and committed about the pledges they are making. Thank you. Also, I think you know we we've been through this um, after the first um, you know oil crisis in in the 70s. Um, we also had inflation, and you know for the first time they put up the oil price. Uh, yes, and um, what happened in the years after 
was that the whole industry worldwide started to become more energy efficient. This was y your, your, your thought, w which we're probably going through again if, if prices go up. So again, my advocation is just we should take um, these uh, price signals seriously. I don't think that the oil producing countries will be able even to think of lower the price because their cost structure in the meantime has gone much, much higher. And uh, from the friends we have from the Middle East in the years, I don't know, 16, 18, and then especially during um, you know, the first year of COVID, they were complaining heavily on the price of oil that existed at that time, you know? So they believe funda they fundamentally. The being there, and nobody buys them because they do. No, but I think fundamentally is not necessarily a correct question because the, the whole energy transition did not start because oil and gas was too expensive. I think on the contrary, you know, renewable energy was more expensive. It's just, again, for instance, we as a company, we are committing to, to reduce CO2 emissions, to decarbonize our operations, although there is a gap now between the green equivalent equivalent and fossil equivalent. But nevertheless, we are saying we are going to commit and we're going to come up with the ways to decrease this gap to get to, to more sustainable economically. Um, and, and, and of course, uh, you know, from the nature perspective as well. But it's not that, you know, it was because of the oil and gas price that all of a sudden there is a transition, right? So it's and once you have transition, at the end of the day, you have alternatives and, and you have less dependencies. So I think that's, uh, I mean, it's a, I don't know if it's a good analogy, but it's a bit like uh, film cameras. Um, I mean, even if someone gives you a film camera for free today, uh, you know, you're not going to take it. <laughs> uh, and uh, we might reach Speak that point. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe as a collector. <laughs> but uh, can I just add on a, a Machiavellian thought? You know, if you were to force many of these countries into a situation where they would have to give oil and gas away far beneath the price that makes it worthwhile their time, they will run out of money for other more sinister activities. So I don't actually see that problem. And in fact, I'd be willing to bet on it for a couple of years because it will reduce their overall capacities. Once again, that's a matter of linking security and geostrategy with the, the logic of the markets. And so, you know, forcing them to, they won't go bankrupt, but having to rethink expenditure on the military, on their intelligence services, on foreign investments, I think would be a very cool thing and, and definitely um, a win for us. Thank you and bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.